Um, now, you've been covering Australian politics for a long time, and on this theme, way back at the time of the Whitlam dismissal, uh, I was a university student at the time, and it was probably the only uh, time I got very interested in politics as a university student. These days, everyone in politics seems to have got involved at university. I wasn't one of them. It was a different era. Uh, but the debate has changed enormously. That was a time of enormous heat in the Australian debate. But in terms of what you've been saying, uh, the loss of understanding of virtue and of respect for one another, how would you say that debate, that very heated debate in the mid-70s, contrasts with the sort of debates we see now? Well, <clears throat> again, John, that's a great question. It's very complex. Let me just make a couple of points in response to that. Um, you alluded initially to the sense of division. And I think one of the real difficulties we face at the moment, um, again, in terms of the attack on liberalism from both the right and the left, this is about blame. And this is exploitation of this sentiment of the, that individuals feel I'm not going to take responsibility for things that have gone wrong. Um, I'm going to blame the Prime Minister or my employer or my union or the church um, or some other influence or some other person. Um, and we really undermine in a very significant way by this absence of personal accountability and responsibility, mm. which is an offshoot of the human rights debate going too far. Now, human rights are really important. There's no doubt at all about that. But I think people are correct to say that we haven't got the balance right between human rights and human responsibilities. And it's only too easy today for people to lock into this sense of, um, I'm a victim. I've been victimized. Uh, other people have done things to me and um, I feel diminished as a person. And this is because of what the external world has done to me. Now, there's always a degree of truth in that, but I think that tied up with this is the sense of, uh, a sense of um, a lack of individual responsibility and accountability, and that is a real problem in terms of where we are now. Now, to go more to the uh, political level, um, I guess um, what I'd say, and let me take the 1975 crisis as an example, because I've written a lot about this and I've just written yet another book uh, about the 1975 crisis based on the Buckingham Palace letters. Um, and I'd make a couple of points about this, having lived through the 1975 crisis. We are all um, obsessed by the present. We're all obsessed by the degree of difficulty and challenge and crisis we face at any one given point in time, particularly now with the pandemic. Now, the 1975 constitutional crisis was the most traumatic political and constitutional event in Australia's national history. And there were three headstrong figures involved, Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser, and Sir John Kerr. And we all wrote at the time, this is a risk to the constitutional order, and it's a risk to Australian democracy. That's fine. That was our assessment at the time. But looking back on it, what's the conclusion we now draw? Well, the fact of the matter is that the political system the constitution and the public interest all recovered. <coughs> there was no national strike in 1975. There was no revolutionary movement. There were no mass demonstrations in the street. People went on living almost normally. There was no mass violence. Many people were very upset about what happened, but there was an acceptance. And I think the sense of a peaceful, democratic, constitutional polity is really deeply embedded in this country. Australia is a really interesting country, you know, because 
We came to nationhood with no violence, no revolution, no civil war, no war with the imperial power. The story, the story of Australia's evolution to nationhood in the 1880s and 1890s, and then the votes, the votes to establish the Federation, to endorse the Constitution, to formally put in place the, the separation from Britain, um, at least 90% of the, the way in terms of the separation from Britain. These were glorious and magnificent achievements, but I think they tell us a lot about our political culture and they tell us the extent to which there is a really deeply embedded sense of commitment to a peaceful democratic constitutional process. So well, that's good. We need to be aware of that. And so when we look at the and properly highlight the crises we face at any one given point in time, such as the health and economic crises we now face, that's good. It's good to focus on them, but it's also good to recognise the underlying strength of this country and its resilience as a country. It's an interesting contemplation just arising briefly out of that, that um, you've written of um, Daniel Andrews' handling of COVID-19 as, uh, I think you said, the worst policy failure in Victoria since World War II, yet only 35% of Victorians, we're told by the research, um, share that view. They seem to think he's doing a reasonable job. Uh, and does that fit with this idea that stability is terribly important, that Australians just want it to move on, or is there a smack a little of apathy in the face of incompetence and indeed I would say extraordinary overreach in terms of accumulating power? I don't think it's apathy. Um, the fact that I made that assessment and it's not uh, at this stage and may never be endorsed by Victorians, that's well and good. I guess my approach to making assessments as a journalist has always been I'll make an assessment according to how I see the situation and that may or may not accord with public opinion. But I reached that assessment based on what I consider to be the fundamentals. First of all, the second wave of the pandemic in Victoria is essentially the fault of the Victorian government and failures by the Victorian government, particularly in hotel quarantine. And that I think is now largely accepted. What are the consequences of this? Well, many hundreds of people have died as a result of this. So this is extraordinary. The degree of personal hardship imposed on all Victorians is unprecedented in terms of the curfew, in terms of the restrictions, in terms of the lack of freedom. The degree of economic pain and economic penalty imposed upon people, whether we're talking now about um, people losing their job or losing their hours or suffering severe financial penalty or the hardship facing major corporates or small businesses, this is unprecedented mm. in Victorian history. So when you put the facts together on the table, I think the judgment that this is the worst policy failure in Victoria since World War II is justified. Now, let's look at the public reaction. Well, it's public reaction during a crisis. And I think what we see at work here is a sense that the public is looking for leadership. And they're looking for leadership of a health dimension. It's interesting that the ratings of all state premiers have gone up. In this crisis, which is a health crisis, and health policy is determined overwhelmingly at state level by the premiers, people have looked to the premiers, and the public has been prepared to support tough measures. It's been prepared to support lockdown measures because the judgment the public has made is, it's a health crisis, so if premiers take tough decisions, we will support them. Now that's not universal, but I think that is the sentiment of the public. Now, one of the points I would make about this is, I think some premiers have blatantly exploited this. I believe that a lot of border closures are not justified in health terms. In particular, the border closures we've seen from Queensland and Western Australia. 
Okay, so I think this is premiers engaged in overreach for which they've been rewarded politically. When it comes to Victoria, I think what we're seeing in Victoria is Daniel Andrews having made a very significant mistake and causing the second wave in Victoria, desperate to ensure there's no third wave, so overreaching in terms of the lockdown and to a certain extent, people being prepared to support that tough action. Now, it'll be interesting to see the reaction of people in 12 or 18 months time when we see this in more perspective. But to answer your question is, uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's apathy, I think it's other factors. We can see changes in political culture coming, a lot of them I don't like. Uh, I think the community is very concerned about security, very concerned about health and economic security. It's um, uh, um, uh, risk um, um, adverse. Um, it's not prepared to take risks. It's protectionist. It's looking to government to solve problems. Um, it's got a deeper appreciation of family, um, a deeper appreciation of neighbourhood. Um, I think there's more of an awareness that society is more than just an economy. So there are a lot of different cultural changes at work. It'll be fascinating to see how they play out. It'll be very interesting indeed and very critical to our future because um, it strikes me that even if you just consider the health aspects of this, the lockdowns, the way they've been applied, if the University of Sydney's medical department is to be believed, our normal rate of suicides at around 3,000 a year in this country will rise to 4,500. Half of that increase will be young people. So there's a terrible price in non-economic terms directly related to health that is being paid, I would suggest, as a result of the COVID-19 and the, the responses to it. I don't want to imply criticism of the ways governments have handled it. Well, I suppose I do in a way. I, I ask some questions around the edges, but it worries me that our focus has been purely on COVID, when even in the area of health, mental well-being and so forth, there are major issues quite apart from the damage that's being done to the economy and the possible impact, disproportionately impact on, on younger people coming out. Well, I think, I think all that's correct. Uh, there's no doubt that the mental health problems arising from the pandemic are really severe. The health problems arising from the extent of lockdowns are very severe and I know at the political level, people are very concerned about youth suicide. I might just say in passing though, um, and this relates to the situation before the pandemic, I don't think that we've had a very adequate response to the mental health problems and the, su and the suicide problems of young people. And this goes to the question of meaning in life. This goes to the resilience of individuals and the spiritual and moral component of young people and individuals. And that's what ought to be addressed in this debate. And to a large extent, it is not addressed by the medical professionals. I think that one of the things that we should look at after this pandemic is the way we are actually addressing the problem of the mental health of young people, because I don't believe for one moment we're getting it right. The great problem I have there is that I actually think we're getting this the wrong way around. We're increasingly looking to government rather than to ourselves. Uh, we're letting them shape us. We're outsourcing uh, their responsibilities or our responsibilities to organise and find our own purpose of meaning and shape government. And we're saying to them, we want them, whoever they are somehow, shape us but just can i just come to this issue of ideology for a moment because uh, you know it was said at the beginning well we're suspending ideology we've got to go for pragmatism and we've seen a coalition government certainly open the coffers in an extraordinary way and i can understand why they've done that we can argue about the extent of it but let's just come to this issue of you've you've we've watched ideologies parties and ideologies for a long time now the liberal party was generally considered the party of the middle and upper classes uh, the Labor Party, the party of working classes. Uh, but many would say that's no longer the case in Australia, and indeed, for, you, know, you can find parallels everywhere in the West. 
The Labor Party's made so-called post-materialist causes like environmentalism, middle-class gender equality, refugee activism and LGBTI rights central to their election, election platform over the recent years. Uh, th this is all a massive shift. But surely we can't suspend ideology forever. We have to have, I know the Australian people are very pragmatic, but we've got to have some guiding principles. We've got to try and establish what we want to look like at the end of this. And that particularly relates to my concern that we find our way back to economic, um, there's some of the tough decisions that are going to have to be made and will require a constituency to recognise that probably all of us are going to have to wear some pain if we're to set up something of a set of opportunities that we took for granted for our children? Well, uh, ideologies die and new ideologies arise. Ideology is always a permanent feature of politics. We go through cyclical periods where one ideology may be in retreat and then we go through another phase of the cycle where ideology is reasserted. If we're looking at the underlying changes in Australian politics, let me just go there first. I think there are three fundamental structural changes over the course of the last generation or generation and a half. The first is the decline of loyalty to the major parties. And John Howard summarised this, I think, pretty effectively a number of years ago when he said we've moved from being a 40, 40, 20 uh, voting society to a 30, 30, 40 voting society. That is, what he's saying is you've got now about 30% of the people committed to the coalition or Labor and 40% floating, as opposed to the previous arrangement where you had only 20% floating. In other words, what we're seeing is we're seeing a more flexible, uh, pragmatic and fragmented community in terms of politics. So this makes life for the politician more difficult because it's less certain, tribal loyalty is less certain. So because you can't assume the votes of as many people you could assume support from in the past, it means you've got to do more to earn those votes. So that does alter the political system. So that's the first change, and that's pretty important. Then if we look at the two parties, there's been, I believe, a really historic and fundamental change in the nature of the Labor Party. And the extraordinary thing about this is it's hardly ever written about uh, as, as a fundamental change. And this is Labor evolving from being a social democratic party to being a progressive party. And that's the transition that you talked about. And so essentially this arises in terms of the change of values and the impact of modernity. So the Labor Party um, running, for example, on climate change and accepting climate change as fundamental to its identity, not just as a policy, this is something fundamental to our identity, uh, accepting identity politics to a certain extent, to a limited extent, but nonetheless accepting it as fundamental to uh, Labor's identity and accepting a number of other progressive uh, nostrums, which we saw on display um, at the last federal election. Um, one of those was that Labor is now seen as a party that gives scant respect to religious faith, for example, and is very committed to minority rights. Uh, now, one would have thought that building a progressive wing onto a social democratic party would have broaden the constituency for the Labor Party. But this hasn't happened. Labor, I think, is in a structural and cultural crisis as a party. What's the evidence for this? Very simply, of the last nine federal elections, Labor has won one in majority terms. One majority victory out of nine. 
Well, any private enterprise entity that had that sort of record would be in serious trouble. But labour continues on. It seems incapable of reassessing. In the 2019 federal election, the Labor primary vote was 33.3. Mm. And less in Queensland. Exactly. And it was under 30 in both Queensland and the West. So this suggests a party whose progressive transition has, far from being a success, has been a handicap. So that's one very important change. The other important change, I think, is on the coalition side of politics in relation to the Liberal Party. And in a sense, John Howard articulated this when he was Prime Minister. Howard went out of his way to say that the Liberal Party represents two great historical traditions. The liberal tradition, that is the small L liberal tradition that people might associate with John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith, and then the conservative tradition, the, the Burkean tradition. And I think as a simplification and as the articulation of a core truth, I think Howard got that right. And that's one of the reasons the Liberal Party has been so successful, because it's been able to fuse these two traditions and keep them together and appeal to voters based on these two traditions. But I think one of the consequences of this is that the party and its supporters are more aware that the Liberal Party does reflect these two traditions. And this became a real problem in the current period of government, particularly when Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull were Liberal Party leaders. Because in a sense, Tony Abbott was the zenith of the conservative tradition and Malcolm Turnbull was the zenith of the smaller liberal tradition, but neither of them was very successful in holding the party together, in holding these two traditions together. And so consequently, there was a lot of division there was a lot of division on the coalition side of politics stemming from this internal warfare. One of the really interesting features of Scott Morrison as Liberal leader and Prime Minister is so far, he's been much more effective as a pragmatic leader, holding these two traditions together, essentially by pretending they don't exist. He knows they do exist. But essentially Morrison so far has been very, very effective in unifying the party and keeping it together. A lot of that stems, of course, from his personal authority in terms of winning the 2019 election. So the challenge facing the Liberal Party will be its ongoing capacity to hold these two traditions together and make them a plus rather than a negative. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with all of that and understand what you're saying. One of the other challenges for the Liberal Party, of course, though, is that they've in many ways lost the top end of town. And they're now appealing to what was once largely a Labor sort of stronghold, the sort of tradie belt. Uh, and you saw that particularly in Queensland in the last election. People who were once have voted Labor are now voting coalition. So uh, that's another great shift, I, I would have thought. I think this is a potential advantage uh, for the Liberal Party uh, because... Um, Elites over the course of the past decade have not been terribly successful. Whether you're looking at management of the financial system, running up to the global financial crisis, whether you're looking at uh, poor economic performance in the decade since the global financial crisis, whether you're looking at the hypocrisy of corporate Australia, um, I think there's a lot of scepticism on the part of the community, not just in Australia, but other Western democracies towards elites. And if in fact the Liberal Party is not as aligned with or as associated with big business as it once was, but as a consequence of that or associated with that, it's getting more support not just from middle Australia, but from low income Australia, then I think that is a potential 
plus for the Liberal Party. It does represent, it does represent a realignment in politics. And again, I think the 2019 federal election is really critical here. And the way I characterise this in terms of the challenge that you've just put forward is that Australia is becoming a more fragmented and diverse country. And the difference between North Queensland and leafy Melbourne is greater than ever before, than ever before. in terms of economic and cultural profile. Wow. Now, the challenge, therefore, for a successful party is that you've got to be able to appeal to both these constituencies and everyone in between. And the really interesting thing about the coalition at the last federal election is it was more successful than Labor in being able to make a pluralistic and different appeal to a more fragmented and diverse Australia than was the Labor Party. And the reason for this was there were more um, elements of thought. Uh, there were more different policy constituencies embedded in the coalition, the Liberals and the National Party, conservative Liberals, progressive Liberals. This was a much broader church. So you had a number of sitting LNP members in Queensland getting re-elected, uh, some of whom didn't seem to be all that far away from Pauline Hanson. Yet on the other hand, you had Liberals getting re-elected in Melbourne, who seemed in many ways to be very progressive politicians. And yet they all sat in the same coalition party room. Labor, I think, was less successful in being able to make this broad-based pitch to the Australian people. And that, I think, is one of the challenges facing Labor. They've got to be able to accommodate the different elements and different constituencies in Australia, from people who like coal or who like gas or who love renewables, um, uh, from people who are atheists to people who are uh, believers of faith. Um, and I think this is going to be an ongoing challenge for Labor to be able to reach out to the different constituencies in a far more diverse and pluralistic country. Um, W.K. Hancock, one of our great historians, uh, wrote uh, fairly famously, actually, uh, uh, of his view that Australians saw government as a vast public utility whose job is to secure the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And I think it's probably fair to say, having been one, that Australians instinctively distrust politicians, except for their local member. They tend to be much more benign about their local member. It's like saying members of the medical profession, um, you know, are all quacks, but not my doctor, or bankers are all crook, but not my banker. Um, equally, though, I think they sort of instinctively trust, or they certainly want government to be there to solve our problems. Sort of a conundrum in there. They're cynical about politicians, uh, but idealistic even about, about government. Do you think there is this sort of dichotomy at play in the Australian community? Because we've seen a great desire to trust government with the handling of COVID. And with the exception of Victoria, most people plainly feel, well, even in Victoria, despite what we've said, that governments have handled it well. So that's been a, a trust booster at a time when the lack of trust in our institutions has been very threatening. It's the great conundrum of Australian life and history. Um, in the end of certainty, I called it state paternalism. You talked about Hancock. I love Hancock. Hancock was a very young man when he wrote that book. It's a luminous book. Um, once I used to read it about every five years or so. I probably read it about four times. Um, and it's, it's a book of shining intellectual light. Um, and it helps anyone who, who reads it understand what sort of country Australia is. So Hancock understood the, the historical experience. I guess the way I put it is that we were founded as a convict colony yeah. run by British military officers. 
And there was always a very strong sense of centralised governing authority. Yep. Some people, in an exaggerated way, like Robert Hughes in The Fatal Shore, said that the worst of Britain, the worst of Britain was sent to the convict colonies. And that wasn't really correct. Uh, but, but there's no doubt that the sense of centralised governing authority and looking towards government and government controls was always important. But there was another story. So Australia is founded after the French Revolution, after the Industrial Revolution, and after the American Revolution. So Australia is founded when the idea of the rights of man are being unleashed around the world. And so we're a new society, but we are incorporating these ideas. Yes. And so what happens in Australia during the 19th century is that because we have no aristocracy, um, we have no inherited ruling class, the idea of democracy take seed in Australian soil deeper and quicker than any other country. Quite extraordinarily so. So, so you've got these two traditions. You've got the Australian sense of authority and centralised governance on the one hand, and then you've got the sense of Australian democracy on the other hand. And this is tied in with the idea that we're going to build a better Britain. And you know who had that vision? The first governor, Arthur Phillip. Mm. This is so extraordinary. Yes. The first governor who, who, arrived, who arrived in terms of Europeans having to build a society in this country, that was his vision at yes. the start. And that vision has endured. So what Hancock does is Hancock understands these two traditions and he's able to locate them um, in terms of the Australian narrative and he captures he captures the conundrum. Now what happens after Federation is that the sense of Australian democracy fuses with the control of the state and we say, the way we build a better Britain and the way we build a sense of justice in a democratic society is to rely on government. Government is the great equaliser. Whether we're talking about the welfare system, whether we're talking about wages, yeah. uh, the arbitration system, protection, um, we'll have tariff barriers, to develop secondary industry so we can have high wages and then we'll have an arbitration system to ensure that we have an adequate spread of income between wages and profit. So you have this whole sense of an Australian state being built on these foundations of protection, wage arbitration and state paternalism. And that's, that's an idealised construct but it's built on flawed economics. And what happens in the 1970s is there's an increasing recognition that we are being retarded. We are being held back by these ideas and these institutions, and we have to break free. We have to liberate ourselves. And that's what happens with the Hawke, Keating, and then Howard reforms in the 1980s. So we smash, we smash these old fashioned chains and we deregulate the economy and we move forward on this basis. But economics can never annihilate culture. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things we've seen in this country in the last 10 years under the Rudd Gillard period and then now in the pandemic as well,
this sense of looking to government, this sense of cultural support for state paternalism is still there. It's still there. Now, that's okay. That's okay. It's okay at the moment because the correct economic response to the pandemic crisis is Keynesian economics. There's no question about that. Mm. We have to do this. I mean, we have to stimulate the economy, spend more, cut taxes, boost activity, create jobs. We have to do all these things. The second phase after this, a few years down the track, will be, okay, well, what do we do in terms of the debt and so on? And that's a challenge and a responsibility we will all face. But the fascinating situation at the moment, and this is the test for our capacity to handle the challenge, the economic challenge from the pandemic is, can we re-engage with big government, government intervention, high deficits, high debt, in order to keep the economy alive and create jobs without reverting to the old fashioned system of protectionism. Now, I think we can. I think we can do that, but that is, that's the challenge for the next 10 years. We'll have to see. I think it's a very, very interesting question. And one subset of that that you've written a bit about quite a bit is in fact the energy debate. And we now see governments, or well, the well, we see Canberra intervening again uh, to try and drive down power prices in a way that's highly interventionist, really, when you look at it. I think that's a very interesting debate because you've had this extraordinary standoff between those who believe we should be environmentally pure on emissions and those who say, no, our jobs and economic prosperity matter more. So we've gone from having some of the cheapest energy in the world to some of the most expensive, particularly electricity. Uh, I guess the argument from many in uh, conservative circles now would be, well, this intervention is necessary because if we can't get power prices down, we won't reinvigorate the rest of the economy. It'll suffer because uh, the COVID-19 has shown us, for example, that our supply chains aren't secure. We don't manufacture so many of the critical things we need, even in agriculture in this country. And the key to being able to do those again without government essentially intervening everywhere in the economy is to get productivity up and energy prices down. We've ended up in a very unusual place on energy. I wonder whether people realise we're, we're actually doing what we do with uranium. So no, you can't use it here, but everybody else can use it. We can't have a new coal-fired power station, but all our competitors are. China's opening up vast numbers of new power, coal-fired power stations. Germany, Japan. Um, can we really realistically have cheap energy without coal? Does this not again reflect the situation where ideology and its actual outcomes are quite conflicted and the Australian people probably are very deeply divided deep down on what we ought to be doing? Well, our response to the climate change situation has been riddled with contradictions, yes. policy confusion, political upheaval, and chaos. And it's very difficult to try and unravel the whole story here. But there are a few important principles in terms of trying to come to grips with the energy situation. And I think that all of them have got to be addressed in any successful policy. So the first one is, this is a moral challenge. Now it's no good conservatives pretending it isn't. One of the mistakes they make is to try and pretend this is not a moral issue and it's not a moral challenge. And that doesn't work. So they've got to be alert to the fact that this is a moral issue. Secondly, it's an energy issue, okay? And so it's a very challenging energy policy issue in terms of trying to get the balance right between a sensible policy of emissions reduction on the one hand over the long term uh, without doing too grievous damage to the economy at the same time. So that is, 
an energy policy challenge and it's got to be addressed as an energy policy challenge. And thirdly, this is about the economy. Uh, it's about national income. It's about national prosperity. Um, and so it's got to be addressed on that third level as a fundamental element of economic policy and economic reform. Now, any policy which is not cognizant of all of those three dimensions will fail. And so therefore, people who take a rigid ideological position just based on one of these uh, principles, for example, progressives saying, this is just about emissions reduction and that must have priority, or conservatives saying, um, economic self-interest must prevail above everything else. Those approaches won't work. So you're in a situation where you need compromise policies which cater to different dimensions and different constituencies and different principles. Now, the next point to make is that right from the start, right from the start, we had both a market-based approach and government intervention. Okay, if you go back, if you go back um, to the early years here under the Howard government and then under the Rudd government, there was support for the principle of putting a price on carbon. The 2007 election, both John Howard and Kevin Rudd supported that principle, putting a price on carbon, and there was much economic support for that. But at the same time, there was a renewable energy target. At the same time, there was a very strong government intervention based on government support and government subsidies as well. So you have the two running in tandem. And we've always had this. We've always had this. So we've had a debate about um, to what extent, you know, this should be based about market forces, to what extent it should be government intervention. It's always been both. It was always both under both the Abbott government and the Turnbull government. Now, there are two other threshold points in this debate driven by politics. The first one was the political outcome, which meant that we would not price carbon. And we saw this, in a sense, with the victory of the Abbott government at the 2013 election and the abolition of the Labor government's carbon pricing arrangement. And Abbott, of course, won a mandate to do that. And today, neither side of politics, neither Liberal nor Labor, believes in having one of those schemes, a carbon pricing scheme as such. The second fundamental policy change here was the failure of the NEG, the National Energy Guarantee, which was a broad-based policy designed to promote investment and provide investment certainty. And that hit the dust in 2018 at the time of the Liberal leadership crisis. So we've now got a situation in terms of the coalition government where it had to construct a policy based on those two political realities. This leads to large scale government intervention that what we've seen in recent times with uh, now leaning towards gas and leaning away from coal and uh, developing what's called a technology roadmap. Um, and all this is based on encouraging private sector investment in energy renewal, trying to meet Australia's emissions reduction targets and uh, working in terms of uh, electricity system which can deliver reliability, stability uh, and also um, uh, fight to reduce prices. So this is, this is a very complicated uh, ad hoc arrangement uh, based on large scale improvisation. Um, and essentially, that's where we're going to be now with both sides of Australian politics for quite some time. Well, it certainly seems so. Paul, you've been unbelievably generous with your time, uh, packed with insights, uh, and I can only thank you very much for the role that you play uh, as a very senior observer of Australian political and cultural life, uh, and uh, long may that continue.
John, thank you very much for talking to me. I'd just like to salute you in terms of these interviews that you've been doing, that you've been doing. Uh, I think they've had a really significant impact and it's fantastic to see you uh, looking so well and playing such a constructive role in your post-political life. So thank you. No, thanks very much. We both love Australia. We do. That's what matters. We do. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. Thank you.